Listen. It's time to get the Umbrella Academy back together. So Netflix is on chapter two of eight in their super powered story arc of the Academy siblings who are now dealing with time travel, secret societies, and dance parties as per Ellen's contract. I think they did well with their bigger budget and I have some theories for how they're gonna be setting up this bigger world. So a big thanks to Surfshark for sponsoring this video. Oh, and by the way guys, spoiler alert. There will be spoilers in this video. Let me explain. So in case you haven't caught up with season one, we have a whole video on it, breaking down these siblings who were adopted by a billionaire when 43 women magically gave birth to superpowered babies at the same time. We covered how they each represent a different stage of grief, considering they were trained to be superheroes by a father who belittled them. This man experimented on them with primate serum, even blamed them for the death of their sibling when it was he who was sending the teens out to fight grown supervillains. I have a deep dislike of children. Needless to say, Vanya, who is rumored to have no powers, ends up becoming a ticking time bomb and causes the apocalypse before the 60-year-old man in a kid's body rescues them via time travel and they end up in the 1960s, where they've now caused an all-out World War III and yet again another apocalypse. They're fighting amongst the dead, we see that all their powers have evolved now that they're fighting together, but then they get nuked and it's all over. So pretty much, when it comes to time travel, you're gonna deal with more apocalypses than Jedis do Death Stars. Because we have to stop the apocalypse. No shit, but that has happened for another 60 years. Not that apocalypse, this is a new one. So considering we have seven siblings, I figured we'd cover them in order to, to just keep everything on track. So starting with number five. I can explain. So number five, in my opinion, is the best character of the season. Show, comic, he's even a movie reviewer. Hey guys, Aiden here, and today I'm going to be reviewing Straight Outta Compton. Alright guys, so I really like this movie. On his spare time, he also saves the world since he's a 60 year old time traveling assassin who got stuck in his kid body. He's the last one to arrive in the 60s when the Soviets are attacking and at the last second is able to be sent back 10 days earlier thanks to Hazel the other assassin wanted to kill him. Now it's up to him to stop the apocalypse and save his family once again, but I'm gonna just say, just like there was enough room for Jack on that board, Hazel could have easily joined him on that briefcase jump once again. Like they literally just did. At the same time, you know, uh, we get a little backstory on Hazel and how Agnes, his love, the one constant Hazel had, has passed. And he just didn't want to live another day without her. But I'm still hoping we see him again. Fire breaks into a TV salesman's house named Elliot, who he practically turns into a secretary. And I really liked Elliot. He's that guy who everyone thinks is crazy because of his conspiracy theories until they find out that they're true. Then he's just a little crazy. He was Peter parking them in the alley, scoping out each sibling as they landed in his timeline, finally being able to justify his divorce. God damn! He brings up the deep state and the 12 who run everything as five gives him the Franco footage to develop, which reveals that their father Reggie was there on the day of the assassination. What's crazy is that in real life, there actually was an umbrella man there which they seem to be everywhere. And the match of truth and conspiracies is something that season two really plays into. We don't have to understand shit about it for it to be real. Well, the truth is out there. They then break into their father's place to find it, but instead walk into a setup. <laughs> Alame theory number one. Reggie is running everything. You can't outsmart the man who taught you. Like, he's leaving files covered in the dust, literal decoys. He's read the script for eight, if not written it, but... Five, on the other hand, is ready to be called Father Time. He's carrying the entire family on his back that my poor boy has scoliosis. I mean, obviously it's also because he's an old man who's arguing with himself, but I love how he drinks more coffee than Dale Cooper in order to keep up with everything that's going on. In season two, they also dive a little into his skills as an assassin, which came after the operation the commission did on him when they hired him, binding the DNA of some of the craziest assassins out there so that he could time travel with ease. And so my money was really on him beating Vanya in that one scene because he's already one and oh. Vanya, do not test me right now. It's also cool seeing each sibling developed, not just in their powers, but in their way of thinking, because at first, Phi was really childish. I've been practicing my spatial jumps, just like you said. See? A spatial jump is trivial when compared with the unknowns of time travel. And now, I mean, he's still a child, but with the mind of a 60-year-old who quotes a passage from Homer to his father because he realized that that's his journey. I gave you such a hard time as a kid. I didn't know any better. One criticism I do have would be how a trained time traveler, you know, someone who should know better in many cases, causes so many like loops and ripples and time to happen. But I do love that they've showcased him as someone who's decided to fully put his family first over everything, even though they always arrive last. Luther is number one, but he's still dead last in my book. I can 
can explain. Everything that he suffered through in season one just comes back to haunt this man again in a different timeline. He was belittled by his father before and after he was born. Yet again, you are experiencing daddy issues. He's still learning to interact with people after being marooned up on the moon alone. Uh, you're an alien. <laughs> from the future and you look like an ape. And it's that crazy ape experiment that his dad pulled on him that still weighs heavy on him. Literally, poor guy's denting trunks and ruining more suspensions than fisted in Spider-Verse. You are so goddamn big. Sometimes I forget what a sensitive bastard you are. Now that he's stuck living in the 60s, he becomes a boxer instead. He's a real life mobster who took down Lee Harvey. And you know, since the series is meshing with real life, maybe that dude is also connected with the table that's running things. But it also connects back to the advice Luther got in season one. Think about the fight game. You got the bill. Even then, he still finds a way to throw a fight. So Jack throws him out, ending his Rocky storyline. <laughs> now in the season one LME, I know I was really harsh on Luther, but this boy! At one point, Luther appears to Vanya during a scene in the barn when he hasn't seen her. He's ready to shoot his sister. He even finally admits he's at fault. I just made it all worse. I never wanted to be the bad guy. Like, when you take into account that Five, who's an assassin, knew better than to tell Vanya that she caused an apocalypse and she's healing and getting better. What causes the apocalypse? The asteroid in You did. Damn, no Lube Luther. However, it is more of an emotional arc for him since not even kids respect him in this timeline. My bad. Tip shit. In season one, he had opened up to his sister Allison, who, while technically not related, they built a bond as they were raised together as he went from being on the moon to dancing in the moonlight. And Aww. also, I Thank have you. to tell you, sweetie, it is still incest if you are adopted. <laughs> since Luther only listens to Papa Reggie, though, he seeks out Allison and realizes that she's married meaning he has to eat his own present. I ate so much this season. And that's a reoccurring thing in the comic where he keeps eating his feelings away. But once they saw Fat Thor in Endgame, they cut it. That said, every time my boy saw a buffet, he still said, Getting tired yet? I can do this all day. Luckily, he befriends someone in this time period who he can finally relate with. And that's Elliot. They do nitrous and just vent about their sad lives. My wife left me for my best friend on our 10th anniversary. <laughs> I know Luther will eventually find his redemption, but he does have some moments here. Kinda. He ends up helping Five find number Five in order to get Five's briefcase, and he's able to get half the job done. I love how this portal connects back to the season one pilot, which is really cool, and how the Academy saw an older Five come back and then turn into his younger self, but also how Claws... <laughs> yeah, he just knew he deserved it since season one. Vanya lands several years after her siblings on October 12, 1963, and mind you, it only took a month after her arrival for the Earth to end again. New timeline, new me. She gets hit by a car as soon as she drops and gets amnesia as his Texas family brings her in. Carl's the all-American father who ends up drunk at nightclubs, while Sissy's the stay-at-home wife taking care of their son Harlan and his special needs, which Vanya ends up helping with. At one point, she even saves Harlan, and it looks like she has the ability to heal or bring people back from the dead, maybe even transferring over her powers if Harlan didn't already have them. But then she also rescues Sissy. Vanya starts to remember her past and her dreams, but Sissy starts to keep her up at night. Don't take this wrong, but I wish I'd run you over years ago. At one point, Vanya does get attacked by the Swedes in the tall grass and rediscovers her power as Five then comes in for her. Look, you can either stay here and wait for the Ikea mafia to come back to kill you, or you can come with me. She goes back to her farm life. Her and Sissy then start a relationship since Carl is always out, and considering she's already Harlan's nanny, you know, they're practically their own family. Until Carl finds out. He's still my husband. You don't love anymore. Just be a little patient while I figure things out. What is there to figure out? Now, I like that they didn't make Carl an all-out evil dude. Like, he definitely wasn't a great guy by any means, but they wrote him in a way where he was already suspicious of there being spies out there during this time. There's one thing the FBI takes seriously. It is a communist threat to this country. So then for out of nowhere, a Russian to land in front of your car with amnesia and snatch a wife? That said, I I'm not condoning cheating in any way, shape, or form. But this fool was bargaining his child and willing to put him up in an institution in the 60s? Like, not even the Kraken can get out of that. Carl then sets it up so that the state troopers block them from leaving, capture Vanya, and then pull all these strange things on her in their facilities. But because Vanya and Harlan are synced, they kind of like shine to one another and she's able to fully remember everything as Harlan pulls a midnight special and deflects a bullet that ends up killing his dad. And somehow Allison's storyline is heavier. So here's the scariest thing to check on your iPhone. Go to your settings, privacy, location, system services, and then click significant locations. 
and realize why VPNs are important. We're not even getting into the ad tracking they do on you. So thanks to our sponsor, you can protect yourself from all that stuff way better than Luther ever can. Surfshark helps encrypt your info so you can be online safely and not have to worry about your digital wallet and all of your data. It allows you to connect to different locations, which helps with booking prices if you don't own a televator, and bypasses streaming restrictions so things aren't blocked for you. And you can boot it up quicker than you can say TikTok. It's available on mobile devices so you can save on roaming when you're out and about, or your home devices so you can be fully protected indoors. It's also an ad blocker, which I think is really cool, and it helps protect you from targeted ads so not even Reggie Hargreaves can listen in on you. And the beauty of it is that it's unlimited, and you can put it on all of the devices that you have. We used to say VPNs are going to be a commodity that everyone needs to be if they're going to be online, but um... That time is now when everyone literally is. So thanks to Surfshark VPN for sponsoring us and setting up a link where you can stay protected and also support this channel. So if you're interested, head on over to get Surfshark VPN at surfshark.deal slash let me explain and enter the promo code let me explain for 85% off and three extra months for free. And that way, not even the commission can snoop in on you. Now compared to everyone else's storyline, Allison's journey is a little different. Everyone's landed in that time that I'm assuming people refer to when they say America was great and how they want it. You know, everything was clean, everything was pure, everything was, wait a minute. I'd like to be served, please. Can't you read, girl? And considering she had no voice at the start, I'm surprised she's all right. I told you, I can explain. At the end of season one, she had her throat slashed by Vanya, but was able to survive, taking a whole year to recover before she could even speak again, and then stopped using her power so she could finally feel like she earned some things. She gets a job at the salon, gets married, and even starts a revolution right before Kennedy arrives in Dallas. Ray would want us to move forward. Didn't he say that to you? Those exact words? He didn't have to. Because this movement is bigger than all of us, even Ray. Mm -hmm. I do worry that there's going to be like a Fantastic Beast conundrum with the more that they weave in into real life events because, you know, people got mad at the Wizards being involved with like World War II and maybe even 9-11. Like, how do they decide what atrocities to tackle when they have the ability and have these superpowers? What do they let be? Especially when you consider that Hargreaves is literally in a secret society that knows about any systemic issues. It's a slippery slope of time travel and powers just in general for a lot of movies and media. I mean, if your power is meant to fight villains, and, you know, vamonos. You can't expect her to spend 365 days in the 60s and everything she did there and then not take that energy back to 2019, you know? Especially when she was a black actress in Hollywood. But hey, maybe that's why they ended the season on what seems to be an alternate timeline, because... There ain't no way in hell that a white cop is just gonna walk away because a black woman tells him to. <laughs> As is the case with every unknown thing, humans just, you know, they just turn from it. Her husband and organizers don't trust her anymore once they think she has these like crazy powers and are ready to sit her out when she finally decides to confront her husband. I'm gonna tell you everything. Wait a bit. How long you been married? Oh yeah, we're coming up on a year now. Damn, he said it with a smile too. Homie's been waiting an entire year? But we've been waiting over six episodes, so... Did you use it on me? Would I even know? Luckily, he forgives her when they take her powers out for a spin, but if you recall, she did kind of use it on her ex-husband. She pulled a queenie on him in the first season, on her own sister, who she helped repress as they lied to her. And how she must have been using it on herself, because this lady forgot she had a child. Klaus and Ben are the first to arrive in Dallas on February 11th, 1960, and with it being a wild, wild country, Klaus easily becomes a prophet in no time, which he then wants to escape from. Klaus's power so far includes being able to summon and manifest spirits in the real world, as well as talking to the dead, but because he's scared of both, he gets high all the time since it's able to dampen those abilities, that is until... One of the few people he found solace in was Dave, who he met in Vietnam when he was stranded in time in season one, and in season two, Guess who? Dave. Yeah, that's what it says on my name tag. Yeah. However, Dave's uncle, who gets him to enlist, hates commies. But what he really hates is... Pink paint. <laughs> Makes sense. You know, pink can actually be very masculine in the right setting. And that's the thing, you know, it, it sucks, but you make someone in with the wrong people, and they will always disappoint you. Klaus relapses, but luckily he ends up crashing with Allison after reuniting with her and even frees her husband from jail. You're my brother-in-law. What? Yeah, man. Family barbecues are about to get real weird. I know this continues the slippery slope of Allison's power and her not using it to 
help her siblings when she did use it on her siblings for other stuff. I know she was a minor, but I really just wanted to know the limitations to her powers, because in the comics, this lady can rumor in a clone. The other big aspect dealing with Claws is Ben, since he's the only one who could talk to the dead, and thus he's the only one who sees her dead sibling. Like, all the time. You need me! Nobody needs your shit, Klaus. That's why you're always alone. Klaus has been living with the guilt of keeping Ben from going into the light after his death as a teen, who still ages in the afterlife for some reason, but Ben never went because he was scared of the light, and it isn't until he got to live once more through Klaus's body that he breaks on through to the other side. When you have a show that deals very heavily in time travel, you know, death ce ceases to have the finality of, of, say, an apocalypse. You know? That said, I'd prefer that over riding shotgun in this man's body easily. <laughs> Diego arrives in 1963, and they put this man straight into a ward because of his hero complex. Now, considering Allison's storyline, which we just covered, and the fact that they are in Texas during this time, you know this lady would have accused him of having a switchblade, and then they would have booted him. That said, his dad does when well, they eventually go head to head. I can't believe I got shanked by my own father. Diego's power at first seems to be like Bullseye, where he can throw things with impeccable aim, but in Season 2, we see that it's really him being able to manipulate objects that are in the air that's his superpower. And uh, oh yeah, ruining a marriage. The sad reality is that you're a desperate man, tragically unaware of his own insignificance. Bruh, how are you gonna fight alongside these people you call your siblings when they let your non-dead father flame you? In the comic, number two actually had a crush on Vanya and even had a band with her with a chimpanzee before breaking up because Diego was too busy playing Rorschach. But now he's locked up with people who actually see his vision. His roommate at the ward is named Lila and this girl keeps baking in her sock. She's the type to break into a car and then sit on the glass, but she's also Diego's new patch, is, which are gods by all the time she whoops them. Jesus! What the hell do you think you're doing? I don't understand you! Lila was actually raised by the Handler after her parents were assassinated. She then had her hair cut like she was starring in the Fifth Element for some reason, varied the name to Lila, and then trained her to be an assassin. Which of course Five knows about. Well, it wasn't very hard. She fights like every one of you commissioned drones. I really do like how they had a lot of clues throughout, which is something we're going to cover with the Season 3 segment. But, you know, they had Lila hiding in the closet in that one scene, which clearly would have been her communicating back. Uh, during a fight scene with Five, she's even mimicking his powers, and that's how she's getting to places faster. We just don't see that transition. But overall, I thought she was an interesting addition to the season. and I'm glad she stuck to her mission, and they had her really be a trained assassin, and not go the cliche route of her wanting to save Diego because it's her boy toy. Um, but then she, like... She doesn't save this man at all. Jesus! What the hell do you think you're doing? I don't understand you! She makes it up to him by hiring him on her team once she gets promoted at the commission to run a security unit. And I love how the commission has its own Jurassic Park clippy intro tape, which Diego completely ignores. Instead, he finds the infinite switchboard, which lets him peek into the future as he realizes. Vanya is the bomb. She will always be the bomb. Now, I really like Kate Walsh as a handler. She was a split role from the comics that originated from a talking fish in a robo body. So I was a little worried when I saw they finally got the budget for the fish in season two and they were ready to boot her. You will be demoted. She's now working under Herb, who just so happens to be the same actor who did the body double for Pogo. And I really like Herb since he's cool with everybody. Man just comes in to make some adjustments here and there for the bureau and he's always on time. Don't mess with case management. Stand down, Doc. That said, the Handler has her own private practice to worry about. She's been scheming in the background, making sure things go her way. She's the type of lady who goombas a cat. She makes fish thumping kids like Darla piss their pants, kills her own guards, and then eats her enemies like a wolf on Wall Street. <coughs> Side note, it was actually Five who ended up eating the fish, so it's a nice little interesting play right there. Usually a lot of comic book villains get diluted in their TV adaptations, but I really like how they split the role and added more depth to her character, and it really is Kate's performance that kills it. On top of that, there's a reveal that she's Lila's adoptive mother, who was one of the 43 kids born on the same day as the Umbrella Gang. She's not her biological sister. As we've seen, Hargreaves wasn't the only one going after children with special abilities. In season one, the Handler recruits Five to the Temps Commission and then uses him to kill Lila's parents as they would have blame it on Carmichael the Fish and then goes after another superpowered child before Lila even knows that she's been manipulated. On top, on top of that, she's also hired... Really quick, I don't think these guys were better than Hazel and Chacha, like 
at all. But at least their wigs weren't as bad as Diego because they did my boy dirty. But their actions were still terrible. Pretty much, they're a trinity of assassins who saw season 3 of Dark and tried being as creepy as they were. They play knife roulette against each other, leave creepy messages in blood after they've tortured and killed Elliot, and drink from these weird bottles, which I'm assuming are like the drinks in the comic that help people translate their languages so that they can communicate with each other. But they should have spent more time training. Not only does one blow up in the forest while they're lily gagging around, but the other does no research on whose house they're barging into and gets duped into killing his own brother. <laughs> On top, on top, on top of that, these dudes made stormtroopers look like Legolas with the amount of times they missed. Like, their coordination was so bad, I'm surprised one even caught on to the fact that they were being duped by the handler. You know, some say the best luck is to die at the right time. Second would be having the vending machine work. So now with everyone set up in this timeline, it's a race to go back to the future from the 60s to 2019. Allison chooses to leave behind her husband and Manya, her lover. Klaus breaks up with his cult. Ben dies, dies. Five kills the board to save his family. Luther picks a barbecue and Diego gets duped by Reggie once again. <laughs> Hargreaves, on the other hand, pulls up on the 12 as they try to blackmail him with a secret identity since he doesn't agree with the assassination plans that he was also a part of. So dude literally peels off his skin and pulls a Kaiser Soze, dividing the 12 down into one. As for the final fight, look, it, it reminded me a lot of Looper. The handler ends up bringing in more people than the Battle of Breaking Dawn, but Vanya just comes in like Captain Marvel and uh, suddenly... It's over. Until they realize that Lila's a chameleon with the power to mirror all of them. It is so nice to meet you. She's able to have superhuman strength, teleport, spin the rumor so that it's in her favor, but I'm guessing the power she adapts only lasts for a little while or, or while she's fighting them and then gets trapped when she switches to another, because I refuse to believe that this man has the power of a true love's kiss. <laughs> Hell no. The handler then attempts to handle another child as she continues to manipulate everything in her favor, and there's even a timeline where she almost does win, which, considering the finale's title, maybe she did. The end of everything? Not everything. Just the end of something. But then Phi pulls a Luther and goes back for seconds before getting shot and is able to save the day once again. Yeah. Look, I know the final Swede was overpowered here, but I don't see how he doesn't come back for revenge on Allison after what she did. Or how these guys accepted someone into their family who just tried to kill them. Vanya tries to take back her powers from Harlan in order to wrap the season, but Boy still has them afterwards. Yowza. Herb is now the chair of the commission and shows up to clean up. The final Swede joins the cult that Claus left behind. Lila disappears with the case if she imitates my dad's powers. And the Umbrella Academy go back to the future as they arrive the day after the apocalypse. April 2nd, but still get through. This is the Sparrow Academy. Please, God, explain. Now, I highly recommend the comic. Way's clearly been inspired by some of the greats. It flows beautifully from panel to panel with Baz Art, and the story is so intricate that my boy pulled up to the Netflix offices and gave them an 18-page doc that not even Benioff and Weiss could miss. We skip the first 50 issues. We just throw you right into what's fun about it. We don't do it origin stories. We don't, I mean, the origin's like one panel. Like, we just skip past all the boring stuff and just get to the good stuff, and I... I think that's that's how the show is true to the comic. It just does the good stuff. Now, when it comes to Reggie, I definitely think he's planned everything from the start. Like, I think the dark side of the moon definitely has some stuff that we're going to be learning about. And, you know, as bad as it seems for Luther, maybe he was up there for a purpose. You know, he had him up there to be a space Desmond who keeps watch. I'm also curious to see how the timeline has changed, right? Like, obviously, he met these six, so he clearly did not want to pick them up later in the future. But he didn't meet Ben, so he may not even be known as Ben, even though they are in, like... Uh, they seem to be younger. He's also killed the 12, so I'm curious how that affects the timeline because now he's the only one in charge. On top of that, it, this man has been planning things since the start. How long has it been since Five disappeared? It's been 16 years, 4 months, and 14 days. Your father insisted I keep track. In the comic, his alien revealed is also nonchalantly just 
you're shown to you on page four. So if that was something that the show was holding, I, I can't even wait to see what else this guy has planned. I want to know more about Pogo and all of the other chimpanzees that are out there. Diego and how he finds the human model of his mom who may end up getting replaced because now she knows about Reggie's nefarious plans. And then there's even Harlan who still has his powers, was holding a sparrow, but considering that there's also going to be a Hotel Oblivion storyline, which may be threes, I'm curious if he or somebody else ends up becoming Scientific Man. A really quick note I wanted to make about the music placement and the choices was that uh, it worked. I really liked it. Something It's something that a lot of Netflix productions and really a lot of blockbusters have missed, in my opinion. You know, they'll, they'll sneak up on you with a known song, but the twist is it'll be like in Swedish. And unlike most shows, we don't add the music after we see the cuts. In the music we we do ahead of time, I encourage the writers to pick songs, I pick songs. So I'm a lot of the time writing scenes to a song that I already want to use. Oh, season one did so well, they gave this man a blank check. Yeah, that was we... more prevalent in season two, I think, because the budget was bigger. <laughs> now as for the sparrows, they are shown in the comic, and I'm very curious to see how many of them they keep. There's this one who like voodoo's himself and is able to hurt others. There's also like the other one who is now the new number one, so I'm sure they're going to have like a complex over here, like a codename Kids Next Door thing going on. Steve Blackman and the, and the and the writers and also you know Gerard Way and Gabriel Ba who originated the comic, they're so specific about what they're going that they had mentioned the Sparrow Academy before we even lift shot a single frame of season one. But what's cool is that there are some of them who may have been there since the beginning, considering all of the birds and the sparrows that weren't just Easter eggs in season two, but some characters who have been here since the beginning, meaning that this is a show that they have implanted things for season one that we're not even gonna know are there until eight. That is dope. I'm also a person who really wants to see more spinoffs from the show after the eight, because I think you could do something with all of the kids. There's even a spinoff comic coming out for Claus called You Look Like Death. It's the kind of Klaus story before um, the reunion of the family, essentially, because before uh, the, the start of Umbrella Academy, they're all very, very estranged. They all haven't seen each other in, I believe, about 16 years. So there's definitely a lot more stories that can be out there. Overall, I do want to see redemption for Luther. I hope that Vanya gets fully loved. I hope that Diego finally is able to get back at his dad. But the one thing that I definitely want to see is the Peppermint Gang. Like, for real, they're like the gang, green gang gone wild. Thank you guys for checking out this video. I'm curious to know your thoughts down below in the comment section. And a big shout out to Surfshark again for sponsoring this video. Uh, I'm curious to know your theories. Uh, if you've read the comics, if you haven't, definitely do. I think that they're, uh, it's different than what's going on right now in the show. There's three volumes out right now, so they're definitely going to surpass the comics, I want to say. Uh, but <laughs> again, unlike Thrones, they have a whole document that's ready on what's going to be out there. And the differences are cool. Like, they, it, it's definitely worth reading the comic because not, again, just the way that it flows, but the storylines are a little bit different and it adds another layer to it so i'm curious to know your theories anything else that you may have noticed back even in season one maybe in season two anything that's going to come up uh shout out to claus this man was doing zoom interviews from home making food at the beginning of some had his nipple out for most of them yeah this man is claus through and through and i really hope that he at least gets the spinoff for claws uh as a netflix series considering that he already has the comic coming out but i'm curious to know your thoughts down below in the comment section don't forget to comment like and subscribe to Aiden's Movie Reviews.